The southern stingray is a favorite food of the sharks that prowl these waters. They are the largest rays in this part of the Atlantic, reaching six feet in diameter. Though they appear weightless, floating over the seagrass, southern stingrays can tip the scales at more than 200 pounds. Unlike most fish, the ray does not have an air bladder, the internal organ that provides buoyancy in the water. If the ray stops swimming, it will sink to the bottom, but it is perfectly adapted to life on the coastal sand flats of the Bahamas, feeding on mollusks and worms buried in the sand. Electro receptors on the underside of the ray detect vibrations created by buried prey, which the ray uncovers by blowing water through its mouth and gills and flapping its large pectoral fins to disturb the sand. It is a feeding behavior known as hydraulic mining. The southern stingray is a peaceful fish, but if threatened, it will raise its long tail like a scorpion to stab predators with a venomous barb. Divers and waders must exercise caution to avoid an unwanted stingray encounter. If you're shuffling your feet through the sand and the stingray is aware that you're coming, it'll just swim away. But if you were to suddenly step on one, it would shoot that barb as a defense mechanism to defend itself. It's uh, apparently a burning sensation, a very painful sensation, like a wasp thing, but I'd say probably times a thousand. One of the most captivating is the spotted eagle ray. It feels incredible to be in the water with the spotted eagle rays. They're large, they're beautiful, they're graceful. They move so fluidly underwater. And just being next to them while they're moving in their slow rhythmic area kind of puts you in that special place and you could be right there next to them. At a weight of up to 500 pounds, this flying leopard of the sea is far from the largest of the stingray family. But their 11-foot wingspan is equal to the world's largest bird, the wandering albatross. The spotted eagle ray has a long, poisonous whip tail used to defend against predators. Failing that, they use size and speed and are able to jump clean out of the water to evade attack. Eagle rays are well armed for hunting small prey, using flat plate-like teeth to crush hard-shelled crustaceans. But these are gentle creatures and run-ins with humans are purely accidental. the southern stingray. These diamond-shaped rays are expert bottom feeders, reaching up to six feet in diameter and more than 200 pounds in weight. Like most rays, they're often found buried on the sea floor with just their eyes poking above the sand. The southern stingray avoids reef walls in rocky areas. Its hunting and hiding techniques are strongest on the sandy sea floor. To locate their target, they use acute senses of smell and touch. But they also have a sixth sense 
called electroreception, which means it can detect the natural electric currents given off by all living organisms. When prey is sensed hiding nearby, the ray sprays water out of its mouth, disturbs the sand with its wings, and flushes out its meal. The southern stingray's much smaller cousin is the yellow stingray. Round in shape, about the size of a tea saucer, these rays have a broader hunting ground than their larger relatives, exploring rocky areas and coral reefs for food. But they use their most clever trick in the sand. When the yellow stingray senses nearby prey, it raises its snout to create a cozy looking nook for a small creature, luring them into what appears to be a safe harbor. Southern stingrays fall prey to larger fish, such as tiger sharks. They are able to avoid predators by hiding in the sand or exploding with quick bursts of speed. A spotted eagle ray, a favorite prey for the sharks at Cocos, glides over the seabed. As long as a limousine with a wingspan of up to 10 feet. Eagle rays are the giants of Cocos Island. At more than 440 pounds, the largest is heavier than a silverback gorilla. Propelled by powerful flaps of its wing-like pectoral fins, the eagle ray soars over the seamount A long, whip-like tail, equipped with two to six venomous barbs, defends the ray against predators and can inflict serious injury to unwary divers. As long as we respect the distance, there's no hazards uh, in both or any kind of ray. In the unlikely event that uh, you don't respect the distance and the animal, like, feels that there's any danger and you, you are sting by, by a stingray, well, uh, that's absolutely not a, a pleasure and feeling because those stings are quite big and they can get uh, through your flesh easily. Plus they are poisonous, they get, can get, uh, the wound can get infected and, and for sure it should be, it should be treated uh, quickly. Spotted eagle rays have a high brain-to-body ratio and are believed to be highly intelligent creatures. Like their shark cousins, rays such as this round ribbon tail are outfitted with specialized nerve cells that allow them to pick up electrical charges from other animals moving in the water. Prey, mainly mollusks, crustaceans and small bony fish, are scooped up from the sea bottom but in the deep waters of the open ocean, the hunter becomes the hunted. 
And sometimes you find this marble race with missing parts of the body and you see the very clear shape of a shark mouth. As they came and they just got a quick bite, they raced some away with an injury and the shark just got a morning snack or an afternoon snack. Southern stingray, almost seven feet wide, skims the seabed in search of clams, oysters, and mussels, exposed in the sand by vigorous flaps of its wide pectoral fins. The stingray is perfectly adapted for life on the seabed. Its flattened body tends to match the shade of the ocean floor camouflaging it from sharks and larger rays. A venomous barb near the base of the tail is capable of inflicting painful wounds on predators or on humans who accidentally step on a ray while it lies partially buried in the soft sand bottom. Waders are advised to perform the stingray shuffle, shuffling their feet rather than walking to alert the ray of approaching danger and thereby avoiding a potentially painful stingray encounter. A rich hunting ground for hungry predators. Predators like the spotted eagle ray. Ten feet wide, weighing as much as a grand piano, eagles are the giants of Cozumel. Propelled by powerful flaps of its wing-like pectoral fins, the eagle ray soars through the open ocean A long, whip-like tail, equipped with two to six venomous barbs, defends the ray against predators. Its speed and size keep it safe from even the largest shark that prowls these waters. The manta ray. One of the largest creatures in the sea survives by feeding almost entirely on one of the smallest. Uh, it's sort of like a bottleneck, so the plankton gets concentrated here, and that's why it's famous for mantas. So we're hoping to see mantas, obviously, and if we're lucky, maybe a new individual that hasn't been recorded yet, so we can add it to our database. Mandy began the Palau Manta ID project in 2009, identifying each animal by the spots on its belly. The spot formation on a manta is as unique as a fingerprint. We started uh, taking pictures of the bellies to identify the mantas and trying to show, especially Palau government, that we don't need to hurt the animals or tag them to be able to find out more about them. We've identified over 280 right now. Five years ago, nobody would have believed we have that many mantas in Palau. A simple ID project can do a lot. By tracking the numbers and movements of mantas, Mandy and the UK-based Manta Trust can identify any population decline caused by illegal fishing and whether or not tourism may be driving mantas away from German Channel. Of course, manta rays, the marine giants that patrol these seas. Though smaller than their oceanic cousins, reef mantas are still among the largest fish in the sea. 
They have an average wingspan of 11 feet and reach weights of more than 3,000 pounds. Mantas have exceptionally large brains, specifically the region responsible for hearing, touch, and vision. They are highly social and curious about humans. If you've been diving a long time, you interact with different animals. It's, you can see the difference, for instance, between a, a guppy or a Napoleon wrasse. And Napoleon wrasse, you can tell there's somebody home. There's an intelligent being in there. And it's the same with mantas. When you look at them and you start realizing they're actually, in my opinion, they can recognize certain dive guides. They will go over a, a dive group and go straight for the dive guide. And especially the newborn mantas, they will play with divers when there's, it's not too crowded. Uh, you can see it's an intelligent animal, like a, like a dog or a cat, and they can learn. At German Channel, mantis swim against the current to feed on large concentrations of plankton swept into the channel entrance. Fins curving around its face direct water into the manta's large open mouth. You turn around and all you see is these big gaping mouths coming out of the blue. It's basically like a mouth with wings on it coming at you. It's, it's an amazing sight. Tissue between the manta's gills sift tiny crustaceans and plankton from the water. A manta is like a giant filtering machine capable of vacuuming up more than 400 pounds of plankton in a single week. At times, manta feeding can be a dizzying display. Depending on the current and the wind direction, sometimes they'll feed uh, by themselves and roll. They call it barrel rolling. It's like an underwater ballet, really nice to watch. The manta may look like it's chasing its tail, but by rolling, it pushes more plankton into its waiting mouth. When the current is strong, usually right before a full moon, mantas adopt an entirely different but equally captivating feeding strategy known as train feeding. So you can get anywhere from two to 20 or 200, if there are that many, feeding together in a train, which is a, an amazing sight. And they'll just keep going back and forth across the line where the plankton gets trapped. One of the largest creatures in the sea, mantas are also one of the most mysterious Research into their mating and birthing behavior has barely begun. For hundreds of years, mantas were simply known as devilfish due to their imposing size and bat-like appearance. But they're very, very gentle. Like uh, when the current's strong, sometimes when you're taking photos or video, it's very hard to stay out of their way, especially when there's that many of them. So when you're free diving, you dive down to take a picture, they'll come straight at you. And it's sometimes you get thrown in their path, basically. And they'll just very gently lift their wing and try not to touch you. They're very careful with people, which is amazing. They could just slap you, you know, if they wanted to. Mandy believes that physically tagging mantas can cause harm to these gentle giants. A mantis skin is like rubber, and wounds can take years to heal. Even though they might be able to recover from it, it leaves scars, and by photographing the mantas at German Channel, we've seen how long it can take for those scars to heal. By photographing them every season, you can start seeing those results. So we prefer to not do actual tagging. Previous tagging studies enabled scientists to track the movement of mantas. Photo IDs can't do that, but Mandy has developed an alternative that is unveiling more secrets of their behavior. She places time-lapse cameras at the cleaning stations, spots on the reef where small fish rid the mantas of dead skin and parasites. 
It takes pictures every 10 seconds or 30 seconds. And normally we put four or five around the cleaning station. And then when you pick it up, you've got thousands of pictures to go through. In the previous year, Mandy was able to identify 44 new mantas from thousands of time-lapse photos. It's a lot of effort, but worth it in the end. Because instead of acoustic tagging, where you can just see a beep how many times a manta passed by, you can actually see the manta, what they're doing, and learn about their behavior at the same time without hurting them. Mantas are curious creatures and will closely inspect the cameras left behind on the reef. When we put the time-lapse cameras, we start realizing that they're immediately aware of something changing in their they are cleaning station, so they come up to the cameras and they unfold their uh, cephalic flaps, which are sort of like uh, feelers for them also. So they're doing like this to the camera to see like, what is this thing that's sitting on my cleaning station? So those are the kind of things you would never find out any other way. Today at German Channel, one of the busiest manta sites in Palau, there are no mantas to be seen. Currents, which should be incoming based on the moon cycle, have switched to outgoing, which means no plankton is flowing into the channel, and that means fewer mantas. Mandy spots something on the bottom, a feather tail stingray buried up to its eyes in the sand. Finally, she sights a large male manta. It's one called Uncle Fester, a regular at German Channel that has fed here for at least 10 years. On this day, Mandy sights just three other mantas one pregnant female already logged in the database, and two others that passed by without stopping at the cleaning station. Mantas may be large, but they are dwarfed by another giant living in the waters of Palau. The giant Pacific manta ray. Well, San Benedicto is really special because it's probably the best place in the archipelago to encounter the giant manta rays. It's probably, the, I would say, the best place in the world to interact with them. They just lay on top of your head and just go with them and go with them, go with them. You're, you feel part of their world, part of, of them, like let you in their house, let's say. It's, it's just amazing. The Pacific Manta is the largest species of ray. With a wingspan of up to 30 feet, the width of a tennis court. Like the whale shark, mantas are filter feeders, traveling with the currents across expanses of open ocean in search of waters made rich with plankton by upwellings from deep below the surface. Two blade-like fins unfold to channel water into the manta's large open mouth. Tiny shrimp, krill, and planktonic crabs are then sifted from the water by tissue between the gills.
Weighing as much as two tons, a lone manta can eat more than 440 pounds of plankton in a single week. When it's not feeding, the fins at either side of the manta's broad head resemble horns. And for generations, mantas were known as devilfish. Their imposing size and bat-like shape fed into the legend of the manta as monster. And for hundreds of years, tales of mantas smashing ships and feasting on sailors persisted. Not until the 1970s when divers began interacting with giant rays, was the easygoing nature of these gentle giants brought to bear. It's looking at you, it connects you with its big eye. And uh, yeah, I've never seen that at any other place with that intensity and being able to be so close to that animal, this is something you will not find at any other place on the planet. Unlike most species of ray, the giant manta does not have a stinger in its tail. Its only defense against large ocean predators, such as sharks and killer whales, is its size and speed. But neither size nor speed can defend the manta from one of the ocean's most remarkable creatures, the gargoyle-like remora, or suckerfish. Highly specialized over 50 million years of evolution, the top of the remora's head is a powerful suction cup allowing it to cling on to the manta for a free ride. The remora's grip is so intense, it is able to stay attached through strong currents and can even hang on as the host fish attempts to scrape it off on the seamount. Remoras will at times venture into the mouth of a manta to find food or escape from predators. There is some benefit to the manta. Remoras feed on parasites and dead tissue. But these hitchhikers can become a nuisance as well, slowing down the manta and creating skin abrasions and sores caused by the constant suction. These giants have come to San Benedicto for its cleaning stations, gathering points on the seamount where resident cleaner fish will remove troublesome parasites. San Benedicto is home to a constant underwater ballet.
propelled by powerful beats of their pectoral fins. Mantas must swim continuously to keep water moving over and through their gills for respiration. It is a life of perpetual motion. Ancestors of shark-like creatures, rays first appeared in the oceans more than 170 million years ago. Mantas, in particular, have exceptionally large brains. Specifically, the region of the brain responsible for sensory functions When they swim like next to you, they actually look at you and that's when you feel like kind of fun. I think they are very, very smart animals. Like their shark relatives, mantas have specialized nerve cells that allow them to pick up electrical signals from other animals moving in the water. Eyes located on each side of the head provide an optimal field of vision. A thin layer of slime on the skin protects the manta from bacteria, helps to heal injuries, and reduces friction as it glides gracefully through the water. Wandering the ocean, gripped by an endless search for food. The giant manta ray, the largest ray on the planet, nearly as wide as a tennis court, as heavy as a car. One of the world's largest fish, fueled by some of the ocean's smallest creatures. Plankton. The tiny plants and animals that drift through ocean currents. The giant manta ray is one of the most intelligent fish in the ocean. But little is known about them. Manta rays were first scientifically sighted in 1798. It wasn't until 2009 that researchers discovered there isn't just one species of manta ray. There are two. The giant oceanic manta ray. And the slightly smaller reef manta ray. Both species thrive here, in Indonesia's pristine waters. 
at nearly twice the size of India. It is the largest manta ray sanctuary on Earth. Fortunately, there's an awakening which is happening now in Indonesia. Um, it's been led, I think, by manta rays. That's been kind of uh, because of the tourism value of manta rays. And so we've seen really an awakening about the need for conservation. Dr. Mark Erdman and the team at Conservation International want to protect these charismatic creatures. Mark has logged over 10,000 dives throughout Indonesia and discovered more than 100 new species of reef fish. He now uses his knowledge of these waters to track Indonesia's manta ray population. From our photo ID database that we have of the manta rays, there's over 400 individuals of the reef manta rays that we've recorded and something just under 200 individuals of the oceanic manta ray here. We think this is quite a big population of manta rays that we have here in Red Rampat. It's a really, really unique place for manta rays and really important that we protect it. Sarah Lewis has worked with Conservation International and Manta Trust a UK-based charity that funds manta ray research since 2010. She and Mark are using a database of photos to help track the populations of mantas here in Raja Ampat and throughout Indonesia. We have um, a lot of individuals to ID in this population, which is very exciting. Raja Ampat's manta ray population could be as high as 3,000. So far, Sarah has identified just 600. The team still has a lot of work ahead of it, and Indonesia's powerful currents don't make it easy. The current is moving in a regular fashion and not up or down. Uh, most of us divers, we tend to hook in with a reef hook and uh, and stay in position. Reef hooking allows divers to stay put without exerting any energy. Divers use a metal hook attached to a rope to secure themselves to the reef. And when the current is raging, the sharks and mantas will generally come closer to you. So if you're lucky, they could come by and hover over you in the current. But reef hooking is not an option for Mark and Sarah. They must be mobile to locate and tag as many manta rays as possible. We're spreading eyes everywhere. And then we'll all be holding cameras, so will be armed and ready wherever there are mountains. Okay, camera Okay. Mark and Sarah leave a remote camera on the reef for an extra pair of eyes. Meanwhile, their colleagues Abam and Abdi patrol a tried and true manta site. In the last year, their tracking data has shown that this site is one of the most frequently visited in Raja Ampat. A bomb assembles a pole spear so he can get close enough to attach the tracker. But there are no mantas in sight. We wanted to spread around our tags, uh, giving more numbers out there. 
and see what, what happens and uh, what we can capture from the behavior of this mantis. They're hoping that if they tag more mantis, they can learn what draws them to this place and where they come from. But the visibility is poor and the currents are strong. The best bet is to stay put and wait for the mantis to come to them. Mark and Sarah use a motorized scooter to move from one site to another. They scour the reef, but after several dives and hours of fighting the current, the team comes up empty-handed. Studying any wild animal, we have challenges with our research. Even though we have a really abundant population of manta rays here in Red Rampart, sometimes we turn up in the right season, the high season for manta rays, the sites where we know they aggregate regularly, and they're just not there. But more shocking than what the divers didn't see underwater is what their remote camera did. We're a bit dumbfounded, actually. We, we had mantas about every five minutes showing up in the frames. Um, unfortunately, quite a few of them at just a wing or a head. Um, not a lot of belly shots, but nonetheless, we have definite proof that there were mantas there all the time. And uh, perhaps most exciting, we got a manta by Rostris, the oceanic manta, which up until this time has never been recorded from northern Raja Ampat. So we're delighted with that. That's a big find, actually. It's a big find because typically oceanic mantas and reef mantas aren't seen in the same area, let alone on the same reef. As a general matter, of course, around the world, there's very few places where you get both reef and oceanic mantas together. Raja Ampat is one of those few places where you do see it, but for the most part, they still segregate. Both species live their lives out in the open ocean, visiting reefs to feed and to be cleaned. Creatures of all shapes and sizes stop in for a tune-up at the ocean's most efficient body shop. Smaller reef fish, like these cleaner wrasse, are specialists at removing parasites and dead skin from larger fish. Butterfly fish specialize in repairing bite wounds. Cleaner shrimp tend to concentrate on the mouth. A manta ray comes in for a cleaning hovering almost motionless over the reef. A host of cleaner fish greets the long distance traveler. Gills flared, mouth open, and wings spread wide. The manta ray advertises the areas that need detailing. The T-shaped pattern on its back and fewer black spots on the belly indicate this is an oceanic manta ray. A reef manta ray has far more spots on its underside and a Y-shaped pattern on its back. Despite these differences, for years these two distinct species were thought to be the same, largely because they were so seldom seen side by side until now.
They have their own separate types of cleaning stations. This is a, a case where you've got them, both species, using the same cleaning station. That was something we've never seen before. We've only seen reef mantas over the last 15 years of, of diving on that site. And it really begs the question of how much do we not see when we're down as bubble maker divers. As the morning sun pierces through the surface, the underwater world ignites in a kaleidoscope of shapes and colors. Smaller fish swim to the surface to feast on the plankton stirred up by the unruly currents. A tornado of tiny bait fish whips through the water. They came here to eat plankton. A shoal of pygmy devil rays, cousins of the manta ray, pursues the bait fish. It's one of nature's most elegant high-speed chases. The Devil Ray is one of the deepest, fastest divers in the ocean. It can descend more than a mile. And swim at speeds of up to 13 miles an hour nearly three times faster than an Olympic gold medalist swimmer. The bait fish defend themselves by joining forces. An army, thousands strong, moves as one large organism, a ploy to confuse the hungry predators. It's hard to pick out a single fish within this silvery mass. Several fall out of line, and the Devil Ray zeroes in on its target. Devil Rays are also known for their aerial theatrics. Like acrobats, they launch themselves out of the water, then twist and turn through the air. No one knows for sure why they do this. It may be a courtship or mating ritual. Another theory is that the devil rays breach to rid themselves of parasites that may be shed when the ray smacks back onto the water. Or they may simply be trying to escape a predator. Manta rays are also known as devil rays, thanks to the pair of horn-like fins extending from their mouths. While feeding, the mantis fins unroll to direct plankton into its mouth. After dinner, the fins neatly roll back up once again. Manta rays are filter feeders. Most often, they are seen feeding on the surface, where plankton is abundant. Their mouths are wide enough for an adult human to fit inside. But the mantis throat is no larger than a human fist, restricting its diet to tiny plankton. When there's no plankton floating on the surface, Manta rays seek it out 
in other ways. These manta rays twirl through the water column, performing barrel rolls for hours. This graceful underwater ballet is actually a sophisticated foraging technique designed to clear a densely concentrated patch of plankton. Both the surface and midwater feeding methods require specialized filaments called gill rakers that filter food. Plankton-filled water enters the manta's throat and is pushed through the gill rakers. The water comes out through gill slits on its belly while the plankton is trapped inside. Fisheries target mantas for these gills. Rakers are used in Chinese medicine and are thought to cure everything from cancer to the common cold, though there is no scientific proof. Manta rays are listed as vulnerable to extinction due to reckless overfishing. For decades, Indonesia has been one of the world's largest exporters of shark and ray parts. So the study at Raja Ampat is key to manta conservation. If they can understand where Indonesia's manta rays spend most of their time, they can better decide which parts of the huge ocean territory to monitor. Patrol boats are assigned to frequently visited manta sites to ensure illegal fishing boats stay away. But if they don't know where the manta rays are, they can't protect them. The discovery last night that the batteries on the old tags are beginning to die means Sarah and Mark urgently need to tag new mantas to continue the study. We work together with all of this research and specifically with the tagging. It's, it's really important that we have at least two of us to do this tagging process because um, it's important that we get the photo ID of the manta before we tag it. They'll use the photos to keep track of which mantas they tag, if they manage to tag any at all. The water is clouded with plankton, which increases the chance that there will be mantas on the reef, but decreases Mark and Sarah's ability to see them. Visibility is less than 30 feet. Even if the mantas are here, Mark and Sarah might not see them. Through the cloud, Sarah spots a moving shape. Every single individual manta ray has a unique pattern of spots on their underside, um, and these act kind of like a human fingerprint, so we can use these spot patterns to actually identify individual mantas. She positions herself beneath its belly for the perfect shot. We just aim to try and photograph the bellies, the spot patterns. And during this process, we're also observing things like pregnancies, um, we're observing the sex of the manta, so whether it's male or female, whether it has any injuries um, or mating scars, and what sort of behavior it's doing. This is a male reef manta ray. Mark approaches cautiously, careful not to spook him. Tagging requires focus and precision. He has to aim the pole spear at a small area in the crease of the wing, where it won't hurt the manta or limit its mobility. Success. With one manta tagged, the team soon spots a second chance.
Sarah tucks beneath to get a photo ID. Mark waits for his signal, then edges forward. Another tag is in. These tags give us very different sort of insights into the manta rays' um, habitat use and movement patterns. We're getting a much better idea of how they're actually moving between specific sites and how long they're actually using these sites, how important they are for them. The quick jab feels like being poked with a vaccination needle, but a little discomfort now will save this species later. The team identifies seven more new individuals, adding to their growing database of 600. It's a great start, but there's still a long way to go. We reckon that there's probably at least two or three times that amount in the total population. Mark uses the last few dives on this mission to collect genetic samples. He wants to know if manta rays and Raja Ampat are mating with the populations from surrounding islands. Mark uses the probe attached to his tagging pole to collect a tissue sample. And stows it away in a vial for safekeeping until he's back on dry land. These genetic samples will reveal whether the mantas at Raja Ampat have been breeding with more distant populations in the last three to five generations. Knowing whether there is a genetic connection is critical to their conservation. If there is none, it would mean that one population can't replenish the other. And these manta rays will require far more protection than previously thought. Genetics also provide clues about how these gentle giants evolved. Sharks have been swimming in our oceans for more than 400 million years. Scientists believe rays originated from sharks more than 150 million years ago. They evolved to adapt to life on the seafloor. Primitive rays are thought to resemble the present-day stingray. They swam using wave-like motions and were armed with a stinger on the tail for defense. Modern stingrays have a spine in their tail, serrated with sharp edges. Many species also have venom, which they deliver through their tail. Manta rays, as we know them today, appeared about five million years ago. A subtle bump on the tail of the oceanic manta serves as a reminder of a time in evolution when the mantas lost their sting. Both manta ray species can be either one of two color patterns, called color morphs. One is all black, the other, called a chevron, has a white underside and black back. Black morph manta rays have a recessive gene and typically make up only 25% of the total population. In the Maldives, generally considered to be a mecca for manta ray sightings, no black manta ray has been identified in its estimated population of 5,000. Sarah and Mark have spotted 10 on this dive alone. Back on the boat, Sarah's newly identified manta rays support a theory that has implications for all mantas. We've added some new individuals to our database, um, quite a few black morph mantas, and this pie chart here is showing the, um, the color morph ratio. So we've got 63% chevron mantas and 37% uh, black mantas. 
why do we in here in Red Rampart have such a high number of black color morph manta rays? One of the theories is that, that this area, this region of the world, is perhaps the center of evolution for manta rays. Um, and that as the populations, the mantas spread globally through time, that black morph, it just got phased out. But um, still here in the, the heart, perhaps, of where manta rays evolved from, we still have that relatively high proportion of black manta rays. Could Raja Ampat be the birthplace of the black morph manta ray? Or is this black manta population growth actually a cause for concern. Chevron mantas have what's called countershading. Whether looking down against the inky black ocean bottom or up against the white sky, the chevron manta stays well camouflaged to evade predators. From below, the dark belly of the black manta ray stands out against the light sky, making it an easy target for sharks, the natural predators of manta rays. But if they are more vulnerable to predators, why are Indonesia's black manta rays thriving? The last 30 plus years, Indonesia has been the world's largest shark and ray fishery. They've been exporting more fins and, and more bits and body parts of, of sharks and rays than any other country on the planet by far. Um, that's had an impact, a, a serious toll on the, the populations here, to the point where it's quite difficult to go anywhere in Indonesia and see large sharks anymore. They're, they're pretty much gone. It is possible that the black manta ray population is thriving because the low population of sharks means there are no predators to eat them. Indonesia's waters are now a protected marine area, declared a no-fish zone for both sharks and manta rays. We're getting there. It's a, it's a slow process, and to be sure, um, there's there's been a major impact. I've been watching their populations recover and rebound, which is something which is really um, reason for hope, I would say. The manta ray is uh, so fascinating for me in their gentle way of moving, and they're actually uh, really graceful animals. They're making progress but Mark and his team know there's still a long road ahead. It's a really, really unique place for manta rays and really important that we protect it. From the fight to save these beautiful rays, to the discovery of groundbreaking revelations about their secret lives, Every dive at Raja Ampat is a chance to learn more about the gentle giants of Indonesia's untamed seas. <laughs>